Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar sponsored by Intuitive and organized by the European School of Urology. My name is Marco Paciotti. I am the Deputy Medical Director at Orsi Academy and Clinical Fellow in the Department of Urology of OLV Hospital in Alst. And the title of, of our webinar is How to Optimize Resources with the most advanced surgical robotic platforms. I believe this is a very interesting and hot topic, and we have the pleasure to have a great faculty with three key opinion leaders in the field of robotic surgery and training. I am very looking forward to listening to our speakers, but first of all, let me introduce my co-moderator and colleagues, Dr. Rui Farigna. Dr. Farigna is a senior consultant in the Department of Urology of the Hospital Daluz in Lisbon. He's a researcher at Torsi Academy and a former clinical fellow in OLV Hospital. So please, Rui, uh, would you like to introduce the topic and our first speaker? Yes. So good afternoon to all of you. Um, on the topic on how to optimize resources with the most advanced surgical robotic platforms, we know that uh, Intuitive has a solid position in the market, but companies like Medtronic, CMR, or Medicaroid already presented their platforms and are starting to present their first clinical results. The presence of different robotic surgical platforms is positive, but it also brings challenges for surgeons, for residents, for surgical trainers, surgical trainees, and hospital administrations. To reflect, to reflect on how to optimize resources with the most advanced surgical robotic platforms, we invited Professor Alexander Motri, Professor Anthony Gallagher, and Professor Bernardo Rocco. Professor Alexander Motri is the CEO of Orsi Academy and the head of the urological department in OLV. He will reflect on which robotic platform should a beginner choose, because some questions need an answer. We need to know if there is a surgical robotic platform that is more user-friendly and allows an easier learning curve, if there is a platform more adequate to learn specific surgical procedures, and if it is important for a beginner to receive proper technical and procedural training and support on the different robotic platforms. Professor Anthony Gallagher is currently a visiting professor at Kaulovan in Belgium and Ulster University, and also the director of research and skill development at Orsi Academy. Being the founder of the proficiency-based progression training methodology, he will tell us how should we train our new robotic surgeons. Although the Alstadian training model represented an important improvement in surgical training, the advances in surgical techniques and technologies created new training requirements and therefore with the proficiency-based progression training methodology, we find ourselves on the verge of a paradigm shift. During his talk, we will try to know if surgeons using one platform need to be trained on another platform, if we should train surgeons on different robotic platforms or should surgeons be trained to be specialized on the use of only one robotic platform, if we should start this training in the operating room or in the laboratory using training models, if the use of qualitative scales like gears and goals are enough to evaluate surgical training and performance, or should we invest our time and knowledge in the development of new technical and procedural metrics, if there is a need to train and retrain surgeons, and if training should be made mandatory and enforced by medical societies and by law. Finally, Professor Bernardo Rocco is full professor at, of urology at Statale University in Milan and the head of the urological department in San Paolo and San Carlo Hospital. He will bring us his view on the pros and cons of having three different robotic platforms in the operating room. Being a surgeon that uses intuitive, Medtronic, and CMR platforms on his daily surgical practice, he is one of the best persons to tell us if the different platforms meet specific surgical needs, potentially allowing better patient outcomes. 
We will find if the fact of having different platforms allow greater flexibility in scheduling surgeries and accommodate different surgical needs, if in the event of a system failure or outage, having multiple surgical platforms can provide redundancy and minimize downtime, he might be able to tell us about the impact of the equipment and maintenance costs over time, about the effort involved in staff training because staff needs to be trained on each platform, which can be time consuming and costly. And we can ask him about the workflow challenges due to the potential need to switch between platforms or, the, or adapt to different processes. Then the challenges on standardization because there may be challenges in standardizing surgical protocols and ensure consistent quality across all procedures. So let us start with our webinar. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Alexander Motri. Indeed. Good. Uh, so I have uh, the interesting uh, question uh, to discuss uh, which robotic platform should a beginner choose? Um, so we know that um, the world is changing. When we look around us, to the to our car, to the to the kitchen, uh, to our houses, we see that everywhere we have an exponential rise of robotization, domotization, AI, big data, and automation, and so it is as well in medicine. I always, I predicted that the coming decade we would innovate more dramatically than we have done the last century. And uh, when we have a look at uh, the increase uh, economically of robotic surgery in the United States, the, the global surgical robotic market size was valued at about $4.4 billion in 2022. And they foresee an expansion and annual growth rate of at least 18% for the coming seven to eight years, which is basically an exponential rise. And when we look at the stocks of, um, of uh, Intuitive, so Intuitive was valued as a company about $40 million back in 2003. 20 years later, this company is now worth over $100 billion. Uh, I don't know if you have stocks. Unfortunately, I don't. But you can see uh, the exponential rise of this company. But still, 95 to 97% of the procedures are still done non-robotically. And this means that there is still a wide open non-robotic field. So we know that uh, surgery has evolved a lot. And so what is next? So we have to, uh, to congratulate Intuitive because the last quarter of a century, when they started uh, to come on the market uh, 25 years ago, they have done a great job. We are, at, uh, we are at the fifth version of the Da Vinci system. This system is very robust and is a very good machine. But they have had the monopoly um, and have built a great barriers to new entry of surgical robots, mainly by superior product offerings and intellectual property protection. Fortunately, some of these existing key patents expired in 2019, which opened and stimulated a new era of robotic master-slave systems. And so we, we, um, uh, we know that there are in medicine nowadays at least 400 companies working on robotics in the medical world. Over 40 of them are soft tissue robots. Well, I foresee that half of them will never see the light. Another half will probably uh, get bankrupt and the other half will be bought by the big one. So I foresee that within five to 10 years, we will probably have three, four, five big companies offering us different types of robots, uh, depending on the indication we want to use it for. 
And again, when you look at the Da Vinci distribution in 2019, there were about 5,500 robots around the world. Um, there were 7 million cases performed, and every 26 seconds, somewhere in the world, a robotic case was done with the Da Vinci system. In 22, there are over 7,500 robots um, uh, available and el more than 11 million procedures performed. This means that they are now at a speed of each 18 seconds that somewhere in the world a Da Vinci procedure is performed. The Hugo Ra system received CE label back in February last year. And you see that despite only being one good year on the market, you see that they are already spread out quite a bit, of course, mainly in Europe because of the CE label, but also in other countries like um, um, uh, India, uh, Australia, um, uh, this is uh, Chile and uh, Panama. Um, they are now going for FDA approval. And uh, once this FDA approval is there, they will um, even rise the speed of uh, the um, selling of their system. The Versius from CMR, these are results from uh, July 22, had done 50,000 procedures in 14 countries in more than 50 centers. I know that nowadays they have done over 10,000 procedures already. Um, so also they are accelerate, accelerating their exposure worldwide. So, but what are the differences between the different uh, robotic platforms? Number one, you have the surgeon console. We know that uh, the intuitive robot, uh, you are working in a co closed console, a kind of cocoon, and you look through two little screens uh, that offer you a nice 3D uh, vision. Uh, the Medtronic and uh, the Virtue system, for example, they have an open console um, and you have to wear 3D glasses in order to have a very good uh, 3D um, vision. Um, the Da Vinci uh, system, but also the Medicaroid robot, for example, they have all the arms in a, on a single bone. While the um, the Medtronic robot and uh, the Versius, they have in the they have um, one card pro arm, so every arm is independent and can be positioned independently from a, from another around the body of the patient, which theoretically offers you more range of movement uh, when you work. Also, the hand controllers can be different from type to type. The one are like uh, little loops, uh, the other one are pistol type. Uh, also, the instruments are different. Um, uh, for example, the, the, the Medtronic robot has um, robotic uh, arms that are outside of the body, uh, clearly longer than they are for Da Vinci, for example. The instruments uh, are uh, longer. Uh, usually they are about eight millimeter, but uh, the Versus is five millimeter of diameter. Um, and also as to advanced instrumentations, uh, vessel sealers, uh, stapling devices are already available on the Da Vinci system, not on the other ones yet. Uh, also the costs are uh, different from type to type. But which robotic platform should a beginner choose? Today, to be honest, there is no evidence available on which system a beginner should choose for um, uh, when they want to start with robotic surgery. But what we do know is that a beginner should start with a structured, high-quality training pathway. High-quality training pathway um, goes to e-learning, technology, technological training, let's say the buttonology of things, virtual reality simulator, dry lab, wet lab, and modular training in the UR. Of course, is simulation-based training enough? Uh, Professor Gallagher will probably talk about that. The answer is no. This is just an educational offer. In order to acquire a uh, 
um, a proficiency um, uh, skill level, uh, you have to go through a methodology and only then you will go and come to an effective training. When we have a look at the training programs that have been uh, published already, you see that basically there are only three structured curricula available in the world yet. The first one of its kind, what came from uh, the European Association of uh, Urology, their uh, robotic section, ERUS, uh, where they, we had the CC ERUS, the Certified Curriculum of ERUS, uh, which uh, we first uh, validated in 2013. But also CERCS came with uh, a curriculum in gynecology, and ERUS also have, has now a curriculum for partial nephrectomy, and very soon also for cystectomy. Uh, we also have the facility available. Uh, Orsi Academy is a facility, is a, uh, which is an inclusive platform where we have all the different types of robots available for training. Um, here you see some examples. Uh, this is the Hinutori, this is the Versius, uh, this is the Metronic robot, and here you see uh, Da Vinci consoles. Uh, but uh, we also have a, a very strong uh, methodology, uh, what we call the proficiency based progression methodology, which is a metric based training to proficiency. Um, to make it very easy, this is the learning curve. Basically, we have always been training people up to competency level. This means that you know about the procedure, but you have not proven to be able to perform such a procedure safely on your own. Uh, proficiency level is just under the level of expert, and that is where you have also proven in the lab to be proficient. That means that you can safely perform a case on your own. The difference between proficient and expert is wisdom, experience. So it is very difficult to impossible to train somebody to expert level in the lab. So uh, we have also done a systematic review and meta-analysis on, uh, uh, on this training. That was uh, Elio Mazzone who did this. And um, basically he came to uh, very good results showing and proving that in these comparative um, um, uh, studies, um, PBP training improves trainees' performance when compared to high-quality simulation-based training programs. And it decreased procedural errors with 60% compared to the traditional training. And these results reinforce the need to fully implement PBP methodology in surgical and procedure-based medical treatment um, uh, training pathways. So which platform is available for modular training in the UR? So in the UR, uh, you have, uh, for example, the Da Vinci system, where you have a closed console with the possibility to have a dual console where the, the, the mentor can or the, the proctor can uh, correct and overtake the control of the robot uh, from uh, the trainee who is basically next to him. In um, the Medtronic uh, robot, the Hugo Ra system, you have an open console. So basically, um, you don't have a new console, but you can easily take over and you can uh, look at that 3D screen with uh, different um, uh, people at one time. But we, to, to date, we have no real data, real data that one is better than the other. And also, what is the definition of a beginner? Because um, um, Medtronic wanted to make uh, two setups, uh, one with, uh, with a lot of um, uh, alarms, the other one without. And they stated to me, uh, well, we'll have the one with alarms for the, uh, for the beginner surgeons, for the expert surgeons, we have a second setup without these alarms. Well, I wonder how many surgeons will call themselves beginners. I tell you already on beforehand, nobody. Yeah, uh, But who is really a beginner? Is that a surgeon who has already performed several procedures with one system and, um, and defines himself as a novice when he starts to practice on another system? 
or a surgeon who has already experienced other robotic systems can define himself as a novice when he starts practicing on a different platform. Or how many procedures with the new systems must be performed before becoming an expert. So what is for sure? When we want to have high quality training from somebody who's used to work with one uh, robotic system, working, starting to work with another system, that is that basically you need technological training. This is also legally um, uh, necessary and the task of the industry to give you the, the buttonology of things, to learn how all the buttons and pedals work of their robotic machine. And um, this is specific for each system. All the other trainings are very probably quite similar. Um, you just have to perform tasks with a different platform, but these tasks and the way you do it can be very similar. So how the, the skills acquired can be transferred between different platforms? Are the learning curves different between robotic platforms? So our experience is that even for a surgeon with experience on a different platform, technology training alone is not enough. Uh, we believe that you also need a virtual reality simulation and basic skills training along with procedural training on animals or cadavers before starting in the war. And here you see an example on how I trained myself before starting clinically with the Hugo Ra system. So we published our uh, first ex initial experience already almost a year ago. Um, all members of the surgical team received official technical training. That is important. I don't think it is enough to train just the console surgeons. You as a console surgeon are completely dependent of your team. So it is mandatory and imperative that the whole surgical team gets trained properly. And we believe that great attention should be uh, paid to preliminary technical training with a focus on the description of the basic device and docking angles. Uh, before our first inhuman procedure, our team was completely trained. So when we did a turnover, it only took us five to 10 minutes longer to set up the robot, the Hugo, in comparison to the Da Vinci robot. In literature, there are also very few data available. Here you see from the group of um, Guy's Hospital, an ideal study with the Virtuous robot, where basically this, they say the same that uh, all the procedures were performed by two experienced surgeons and a dedicated team. They did a preoperative training, uh, which involved of 10 hours of online module, six hours of virtual reality training, and dry and cadaveric labs for three full days. Professor Rocco and his team, they have done um, their uh, first description of a clinical case using Virtius again, that RAR case was performed by Bernardo Rocco with extensive experience with Da Vinci, and the whole surgical team had previous uh, robotic experience, and all surgeons underwent a prior three-day cadaver laboratory session. I swear to you, if Professor Rocco takes his time to do that, please believe me, it is mandatory to do so. Preclinical training and accurate surgical planning are key in facing some issues that may arise during procedure. So to conclude, which robotic platform should a beginner choose? Today, there are no data right, to say that one specific platform is better than the other for beginners. But a beginner should always start with a high quality training pathway, such as a validated CCIRUS. A beginner should choose the platform he or she will be allowed to practice on at his or her center. So we don't know yet whether skills and experience can be transferred from one platform to the other, but everybody is a beginner with a new platform. Technology training is mandatory and data suggests that even expert Da Vinci users should undergo preclinical training, including dry and wet lab, 
before starting clinical practice with novel robotic platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Motri. That was a great presentation. Very interesting. Uh, we see that this field is still, let's say, uh, to be investigated and, uh, and we need more data to address this topic, but you gave uh, some uh, uh, very important answer about um, uh, about how a beginner should approach robotic surgery and also about how an experienced surgeon should approach uh, a new console uh, different from the one is used to work with. Uh, so by the end of the of all the three talks, we will have a common discussion. And uh, I would also like to invite all the attendees uh, to send questions uh, using the Q&A uh, feature on the screen. Uh, but now, with the, no, no more delay, uh, let me introduce uh, the, uh, the next speaker. It's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Prof. Tony Gallagher, uh, who is the Director of Research and Skill Development at Orsi Academy and uh, Visiting Professor at uh, KU Leuven in Belgium and Ulster University. Uh, please, uh, Prof., the floor is yours. The Thank you, Marco. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk directly to the trainees. And when I was constructing my, I was thinking, okay, what advice would I give somebody and what argument or what data would he use to try and convince them? As Alex has said, the only one thing is certain, not just in surgery, but in procedure-based medicine, is there's going to be change and it's going to be advancing and more sophisticated technology. And we're talking here this evening about the robotic surgery and the introduction and safe rollout of robotic surgery is a major hurdle to its adoption. And it depends on the skills of the operator. Make no mistake about that. But that's not just true about robotic surgery. It's about any advanced technology. And what we've seen over the years is there's been significant safety issues, patient safety issues about the introduction and safe rollout of new interventional technology. And the problem is that we're still using a training paradigm that was developed during the late 19th, early 20th century by Halstead at Johns Hopkins. It's frequently described as see one, do one, teach one, but that's not correct. That's a, a caricature of what uh, Halstead actually did. If you worked for Halstead, if you were one of his trainees, you spent long hours on the wards, and in the operating room. So by sheer volume of exposure, you had the opportunity to become a good surgeon. He also required his trainees to teach and be the do teach will know there's nothing forces you to know your subject as well as having to uh, teach it to other individuals. And he required his trainees to do research. And I think that he required them to do research uh, was not just to understand the science, uh, the scientific findings as it applied to their clinical research or clinical work, but also the capacity to apply uh, to attend to important detail. However, that approach is now considerably challenged uh, in 21st century medicine, especially for advanced technologies. And the Halsteadian approach in the 21st century has morphed into something that is not as robust as it should be. At Orsi Academy, we have fabulous facilities. We know we have fabulous facilities, but we're also acutely aware that having fa fabulous facilities doesn't necessarily mean that we do effective training. And we also know that it's not as simple as point the trainee at the robots or the technology or the simulation and ask them to learn. It's simply not that simple. A number of years ago, I proposed an alternative approach to training rather than competency-based training. I propose that we uh, implement a proficiency-based progression approach to surgical skills training. Here we have a traditional learning curve. Uh, we take a novice, we give them some education, they're deemed an advanced beginner. We give them some, train or some training and they're deemed competent. And what you can see is competence really not that far up the learning curve, like, uh, whereas proficiency is considerably further up the learning curve and well on the way to being an expert. And proficiency is what I'm proposing that we aim to train to. Proficiency-based progression 
uh, is a scientific approach to skills training. So it's by default quantitative. And understanding the skills to be trained are derived from uh, experienced users and clinicians. And performance benchmarks, whether they're cognitive or, or technical, are based on the objectively assessed performance of trained and experienced users. They're not based on estimates. Trainees do not progress in their training until they demonstrate the requisite performance benchmarks. And the requisite performance benchmarks are always based on the mean performance of the experienced practitioners who actually can do the procedure and are good at it. And training outcomes are not presumed, but quantitatively verified. So the first thing I would say to the trainees is, you're gonna need validated metrics for the task or procedure to be learned, whether that's the technical aspect of the robot, the buttonology, whether it's the, the basic surgical skills or whether it's procedure skills. Metrics are core to it. And the metrics are the core of proficiency-based progression. And they're derived from a procedure characterization. Procedure characterization is just the detailed portrayal and description of optimal performance. And the metrics, uh, we identify the metrics, the steps of the procedure, any procedure or discrete task. We pick a reference approach to the performance of the procedure or the task. That is, if you can't do a straightforward approach, you're not going to be able to do something more complex. Uh, so the trainee should know how it's performed, in what order, with what devices. But most importantly, uh, what should not be done, that is errors or deviations from optimal performance. And the metrics, we identify phases of the procedure. That's a large chunk of the procedure. We identify uh, steps, which are component, uh, are component of the task, as a series aggregate of which uh, constitute the completion of the specific procedure or task, an error, the deviation from optimal performance, and a critical error, which is also a deviation from optimal performance, uh, but it's more serious, it's more egregious. It jeopardizes the su success of the procedure or task and creates a significant iatrogenic insult to the patient's issue. A number of years ago, Alex, Peter Wicklund, Marcus Grafen, and Justin Collins and myself developed the metrics for robot-assisted partial nephrectomy. We identified 80 steps, 245 errors, 57 general errors, and 110 critical errors. Uh, so once you have the metrics for a procedure, uh, the metrics should then be used to construct a curriculum. And they should also be used to identify which parts or tasks of the task or procedure the trainee will have most difficulty learning. And this information can come from the validation uh, evidence. Uh, here's uh, one part of the validation uh, evidence for the, the RARP. Do the metrics distinguish between experts and novices, what used to be called construct validity? Uh, we compared the intraoperative performance of experts who'd done about a thousand procedures uh, and novices who'd done more than one but less than 10 full RARP cases. Here with the mean and 95% confidence interval, the number of steps completed, the experienced surgeons are doing marginally better. Here we have the objectively assessed interoperative errors. And what you can see, the consultants or the experienced surgeons are doing considerably better, but there's wide variability in the performance. In fact, three of the surgeons are performing outside the 95% confidence interval, and two of them are performing worse than the worst trainee. We then, I then asked Alex, Peter, and Marcus, okay, where do you expect to see the biggest difference between the groups? And uh, you know, what do you think the trainees are going to find the most challenging? And basically what they said was, it's going to be the neurovascular bundle dissection. Here we have the mean scores of the experts are quite good. They're making low to no errors. Here we have the scores of the novices who are quite good. And where we see the largest difference is precisely where the, uh, Alex and Peter and Marcus predicted, neurovascular bundle dissection. Uh, and the sort of errors that we're talking about are damage to the neurovascular bundle by cutting, clipping, or diathermy, or where the neurovascular bundle is bluntly dissected off the prostate due to excessive tension by the consul surgeon or the assistant. 
Here with the main scores of the novices who are not so good, and that's fine, they're novices. Uh, and we're saying that uh, they're slightly worse than their more skilled colleagues. And here we have the performance of consultants who are really not performing that well. And in fact, they're performing more like the, the trainees than they are their consultant peers. And so the metric validation process tells us which phases of the procedure uh, to emphasize during training. Now, we train all of the procedure, but we emphasize those parts. And the metrics also tell us that some of the experienced surgeons uh, perform the procedure not very well. Now, you can draw your own conclusions from that, but I know what, I, what conclusion I would draw from that. The metrics should also be used for explicit and formative feedback to the trainees. Here's why one example from the Robot Assisted Low Anterior Resection metrics we developed with the European Society of Color Proctology. This is about the transaction of the rectum. So the rectum is transected, just to complete this step, the, the rectum is transected completely with no more than two staple firings in a line perpendicular to its longitudinal axis. The staple line should be complete and the lumen of the rectum should be closed. So just to complete a step, the trainee must complete all of those criteria. On top of that, it's an error if the staple line is not perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, if there's more than two staple firings, or if there's a misfire or the staple hasn't been properly used. Misfire is probably not correct. It's a critical error if it's an incomplete transaction line or there's a bowel perforation. So the metrics are detailed, they're explicit, and they're formative. As Alex uh, identified, uh, we did a systematic review and meta-analysis, and what we found was that uh, proficiency-based progression approach to training in comparison to a quality assured approach resulted in a 60% reduction in objectively assessed performance errors. Uh, I don't know if you realize it, but that's level 1A scientific evidence for an approach to training. So to conclude, uh, training courses, uh, when you look around, may appear to have all the right elements, but you've got to look at what way they're helping you uh, achieve the proficiency benchmark. Elaborate, complex, pretty, or expensive simulation platforms don't necessarily mean better. And when metric-based simulation simulations don't exist, improvise. Training effectiveness is about the metrics, not about the simulation. Sometimes we lose sight of that. Uh, Metric-based performance feedback to trainees should be unambiguous, and the training should allow the uh, trainee to learn what to do in a safe environment. But more importantly, it should afford them the opportunity to learn what not to do. So to conclude, proficiency-based progression simulation tra training derived from a procedure characterization works. The principles and practices are the same across all of medicine and healthcare, not just robotics. And what really matters are training outcomes. What we need to know is what is the trainee able to do at the end of the course? Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gelger, for your impressive talk. And now I have the pleasure to present you our third speaker, Professor Bernardo Rocco. Uh, he's uh, the full professor of urology at Statale University in Milan and the head of the urological department in San Paolo and San Carlo Hospital. You have the ground, Professor Bernardo. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very honored to be here and would be very thankful to EAU and uh, Intuitive and also to my uh, co speakers and co moderators. So let me share my screen. Okay, so my topic is pros and cons of having three different platforms uh, in my hospital. And uh, so a very, very brief history on how the system arrived. The history of uh, robotics in our places started in September 2020 before we got there with the first system. And uh, urology and gynecology joined the general surgery only in June 2021 with only one system placed. A second system was installed in the second facility that we have. We are both on both facilities in June 2022. So we had two Da Vinci systems and uh, uh, we perform uh, 203 uh, procedures uh, on one side and 300 uh, on the other one. 
And uh, lately, later on, October 2022, we got the new robotic platforms, one Medtronic and one Versus from CMR. So we find we had four systems, uh, of which three of them were in one of the two facilities. So let's have a look at what happens after this uh, uh, positioning. So let's start with the pros. The concomitant introduction of new robotic systems carries the unique opportunity to explore the technology, define users and indications, evaluate skills required for the transition to new systems. Some of these topics, I think, have been covered by uh, the previous speakers. So if you look at the, the, the technology, you see that so we move from um, the typical Da Vinci console, the immersive console, to the uh, Metronic that has more or less the same um, uh, feed platform with a different uh, um, pistol grips as an open console with this uh, kind of iPad that allows you to make all the modification of the setup and a very nice uh, 3D screen that in, is an uh, open setting. And this is the CMR that is uh, close to the Metronic console, but uh, the particular thing of this uh, console is that you don't have foot pedals and everything is on the hands. So uh, three different concepts. In the detail, you see that uh, these are the typical uh, Da Vinci masters. Here you have the uh, pistol grips. First big difference. Usually we keep the third finger in the Da Vinci, the second finger in the Medtronic, whereas with the CMR, everything changes because it seems like having a PlayStation um, controller that is split into in two parts. Again, no foot pedals. Regarding the uh, operative arm, you see that here you have uh, the single boom that comes with the XI. Of course, we tried all the other systems in the past, but uh, at the moment, the standard of Da Vinci is the XI with the boom. Whereas the Metronic has four different arms. Here you see the fifth that is just a backup arm and the CMR again, who has different arms with all the joints that we will see uh, right after. So um, you have the chance, the opportunity of uh, uh, the revision of um, how you put the trokers. You see here that uh, uh, the, um, whereas the, the, the Da Vinci system suggests to put the trokers in line, I always kept my position with a W shape for the prostatectomy. And this was good because uh, with the Medtronic and the CMR, basically we, we try to find the same way of positioning the trokers. This is, of course, not to make too confusion in the OR. So with the W shape, with the Da Vinci, with the Medtronic and the CMR, more or less, you can keep the same approach to the system. Different is the positioning of the robotic arms. This is the scheme that's come from Alex Motri Group. You see that the systems, the Medtronic systems come, uh, at least for us, that I'm right-handed, from the left side with the three of the uh, robotic arms and only one coming from below on the right. Look that the camera port comes from the feet. Whereas on the CMR, the disposition of the arms is different because of the, uh, the joints of the system. And you see that uh, the camera port comes from the above. So this is a very important information, particularly for the, the final questions of the course. So the, the position of the assistant is the same for the Da Vinci, is the same for the Metronic, is the same from the CMR. Here from the drawing, it seems that uh, the space is very narrow. Partially it's very narrow, but you, you can have it uh, working properly. The other thing that you can have here on this side is that the uh, robotic instruments and the robotic arms are much longer on the Hugo system. So the assistant have to be very well trained. And I come back, of course, to the concept that was explained by Alex and by Professor Gallagher. You see here in the details, the um, need of uh, using uh, dif different uh, um, uh, manipulator, the different uh, controllers. And uh, in my personal experience, what was uh, uh, disturbing was the fact not to have a foot pedal. So with the, with the thumb, you needed to make all the movements and also to generate energy. So I asked and obtained to use for my procedures, the foot pedal, that it was a novel thing, is what makes my life much easier. Other small modification that we made, 
as uh, to change a little bit the angles of the fourth arm compared to the Alex procedure. And probably this is due to the fact that it was a little bit less than that, and what I think. But anyway, we just make a small, <coughs> sorry, a small change, and we uh, we had uh, the chance of publishing this uh, um, this uh, small difference in the use of the fourth arm. So the other point is which users from which platform we could ask ourselves is every platform is good to do every kind of surgery. So let's have a look of the opportunity of evaluating users and indication. So the experience with Versus is made of 79 cases of general surgery, but look at which kind of surgery done by this guy that is uh, Dr. Pisani, a very skilled lab surgeon. He's not a robotic surgeon. He did a lot of cholecystectomies, hernia, and some hemicolectomy. These are the gynecological surgeons. They are both lab and da Vinci surgeons, and they do with the Fursius 21 procedures with ovarian cysts, salpingectomy, and some hysterectomies. We did, uh, myself and Professor Bianchi, uh, we are um, uh, robotic surgeons uh, at our center. He's the chief of general surgery. I'm the chief of urology. We did three cases. I did three radical prostatectomies. He did three cholecystectomies. So I would say with the versus, the experience that we, we did so far is the experience mostly of uh, simple cases. Uh, and uh, uh, that most or, uh, more or less was the same thing with the others with the other um, professionists. With the Yugo, things were a little different because the, the gynecological cases include colposarcopathy and promontofixation. The surgeon was the same. And we did a, a, a robotic prostatectomy also with lymph node dissection, um, radical cystectomy also with neobladders and simple prostatectomies. Uh, same thing for uh, Professor Bianchi. He did a right-left hemicolectomy and also sigmoidectomy. So I uh, would say the kind of diseases that we treated and uh, I would say the, the level of surgery raised a little bit with using the Ugoras in our experience. So which skills are required? The opportunity to evaluate skills are required for each system. Our feeling was that the, um, uh, the Versus system has, I would say, something that was more familiar for the laparoscopic surgeon, particularly because of the joints that are less distal compared to the other system. But if we look at the Hugo Ross, uh, uh, I would mention my assistant, Chiara Siginolfi, who made a nice study, including 70 participants of different backgrounds to see uh, their experience and uh, their performance with the uh, pick and place exercise of uh, the simulator. So they first do a first round just to break the ice with the system. And then the metrics of the second round were recorded. A multivariate analysis was done to evaluate the impacts of baseline variables on separate metrics. So what we want to understand in this situation was uh, how the previous experience matters in this, uh, in this kind of surgery. So what we found is that prior consular expertise improves time required to complete the exercise across all age groups. So you see here from these graphs that the robotic consul experienced with the Da Vinci, that is the blue line, uh, was um, associated with better, um, with reduced time to complete the exercise. Whereas laparoscopy or no experience was associated with worse operative time. The other thing that made the difference was the age. The younger was the surgeon, the better was the skill, the results. That was just a matter of time. More or less the same results were achieved when we look at the overall score during simulation. So what we saw is that age and robotic experience were associated with better results in terms of uh, overall score with the, with, the, with the drill. So these are, I would say, the first things that we found that were simply, I would say, interesting. On the other hand, we look at the cons, but we would like to call issues rather than cons because uh, the opportunity of having different platforms is, a, is an issue uh, rather than a cons, is that, um, the surgical team is a dedicated team or different teams, or we just can use the same. This can be a key because we have three different systems. Then we should rethink the surgical steps. We get out from our comfort zone. As uh, uh, Professor Motri were mentioning before, you always, of course need a training and you find yourself in a different environment compared to the last 10, 15 years. 
the learning curve related issues might be a real concern or an issue in a way. The OR setup can change. And so, and then we have to see how to develop training. And of course, this is uh, the uh, topic that has been covered better than I can do by uh, the former speaker. So uh, we are a nice group, but of course, if you need to have all the same people, the same robotic surgeon on all the four platforms that we have, uh, three different, but four overall, it can become um, a problem. So uh, at the starting point, we decided to uh, separate uh, the teams. So we have a Da Vinci team, we, the same team covers the Versus, another team cover the, um, the Hugo Ross, uh, and I'm involved in all the three. So uh, I think that is important to quote again the ideal study that mentioned the need of making some, uh, uh, would say, some 15 minutes of dry simulation uh, before starting the case with a different platform. My feeling is that that is a good, uh, good suggestion. Of course, when you change a little bit, you need to find yourself in the new environment, particularly in, in the same day you do two different procedures with two different systems. So we have to rethink some surgical steps because we said Hugo has longer arms, but as, as an example, Versus has shorter instruments. So even if we're able to keep the same trocar positioning, there are some differences that have to be kept in mind. So learning curve is another point. When you make your plan to do surgery, you, of course, you have to consider that the consult time might change, even if you do the proper training. And this is our experience. So we started for both Medtronic and CMR with longer consult time that particularly with the Hugo, where we have much more experience, that is, of course, a minimal experience, but it's a little bit more than, than a CMR. You see that little by little, the speed of the operation uh, becomes, uh, the operation becomes quicker. And uh, particularly, uh, it took uh, like three cases to go to an acceptable uh, console time. At least this is our experience. Again, if we look at the uh, OR setup, you see that uh, you can have new issues on how you position the arms. So you need to work with the nurses and uh, you see that you have to make all the simulation to try to avoid uh, clashes and other pr problematic problems. So you need to train a lot of the nurses and of course the anesthesiologists. And uh, you see that it's important for the uh, setup to work with the manufacturer's assistant. So now, of course, none of us uh, perform uh, Da Vinci surgery with uh, uh, Da Vinci guys in the, in the, in the OR unless uh, they come and visit us, but we don't need to have support. Whereas on the other system, we need all the engineers with us to uh, set up the OR and to work in the, in the best way. And uh, of course, it might have uh, differences in the in the trocar placement. If we are not speaking about prostatectomy, but as an example, with cystectomies, of course, you have to make some differences because of, uh, as an example, the re reconstructive phase. Um, moreover, uh, the training. The training for our team has been delivered, uh, I would say, uh, for every platform. For Hugo Ross, we went to visit Alex at the Orsi Academy. We, we had a very structured training with all the modules, the e-learning modules, the simulator, the PIG model, and uh, the PPP method for proficiency. For the verses, we have another dedicated environment, but before that, we had uh, some, uh, um, would say, virtual training that was very long, very structured. In my personal experience, verses need much more training compared to Hugo, or one who comes from uh, the Da Vinci system. And the question can be now, how should we deliver our multi-platform uh, training, our training at the multi-platform institution? Should we require to send everyone to do this structured training, or should we try to take um, care of the training of our team by ourselves? This can be a, a topic. Just to go to the conclusion, <clears throat> our experience uh, in terms of uh, comparison of the systems that I would like to show a quick video um, was just to see uh, in terms of metrics, using the ORSI metrics, if the three systems at the very beginning of the very first case uh, encounter critical errors or major errors anyway. And this uh, was done to show you all the same, the same passages then at the same time with the three systems. So uh, on the top left, you see the Da Vinci. On the top right, you see the Versus. On the right bottom, you see the Hugo Ross. 
So you see that uh, you can appreciate the fluency of the instruments, the quality of the colors of the instrument, the speed of movements. And of course, uh, we have to remember that we have much more experience on the use of uh, Da Vinci compared to the others. So here you see the different phases of the operation. This is the bladder neck that is reported with all the systems. You see that uh, the traction with the Da Vinci are very effective, whereas with the other system, uh, we still have some issues. <laughs> we will see in the next images. Uh, you see at the CMR as an example that the uh, the joint of the left arm, uh, of course, also on the right, but the, what I want to show you is on the Maryland, um, the articulation is a little bit more proximal, so sometimes can be uh, more complicated to deal with this uh, uh, suturing or uh, some other movements like passing below the urethra. So this, these things are, of course, a matter of uh, evaluation. So, just a few further images. You see here the seminal vesicles and the vas. The technique is the same. The assistants are the same. The trocar positioning, as I mentioned, are the same. So you can have a direct visual comparison synoptic of the three systems uh, doing the same things. So you see here the retractions that are uh, acceptable with all the systems. And uh, just want to go closer to the end of the procedures. You see that on the bottom right, the dissection of the bundle with the retrograde approach with the Yugo. On the, on the top left with the, with the Da Vinci, as I mentioned. So. I don't want to make comments on that, but uh, I think that uh, you can uh, understand uh, probably at least uh, this very, very beginning, uh, the difference between the systems. So um, just to have uh, uh, information on what happens with these uh, three systems and that was published on Journal of Urology, Open uh, Science, you see that uh, we didn't have any critical error during our experience, initial experience with Hugo and CMR. Whereas we have some metric errors with the Yugo and CMRs, there were some collisions. And of course, we need a little bit more experience to avoid these uh, uh, metrical errors that are reported in this study. Um, with Yugo, we had also um, one cystectomy in a BMI 35 guy with a ureterocutaneostomy and uh, an intracorporeal neobladder. This was a very challenging uh, situation because it was the first ever, and uh, we had to set up some new things like. Uh, um, some uh, understandings of the trocars because the size is different to see if the Yugoras can uh, handle the trocar in trocar, but then in the end, we were happy with the, with the, with the procedures. So far, we don't have a huge experience, nothing comparable with Alex. So we only have 15 cases with Medtronic and we stop uh, for uh, the, uh, the three um, prostatectomy with CMR for organizing reasons because we had to push more on the uh, Da Vinci surgery, but uh, we will recover our experience on that. And I just want to conclude with this uh, nice uh, time-lapse to show you our ORs that are one close to the other and has all the system all together. So thank you very much indeed for uh, the opportunity of being here with you and I come back to the moderators. Uh, thank you, Professor Rocco. Thanks for this uh, fantastic talk and for sharing um, with us uh, your experience as the first surgeon uh, worldwide using the three platforms uh, uh, in clinical practice. Um, so I understand that you don't want to express, let's say, a preference uh, between the three platforms, but my question um, uh, for you and also for Prof. Motri is, uh, did you have uh, to make uh, any change in your technique for uh, adapting to, to the system or were you able to apply uh, your surgical technique uh, uh, to the new platform uh, uh, without having to change uh, major uh, steps of the, the technique? So it's a very good question. Actually, I tried to keep the procedure uh, the same, the same way I do it uh, with the Da Vinci. Of course, this was not completely easy. 
I felt much more comfortable in the transition uh, towards uh, Hugo rather than Versus. Uh, probably this is part of the fact that uh, most of the, uh, would say, um, the way the Versus works uh, uh, with, the, with the handle is a little different. Whereas uh, particularly the foot pedal of Yugo is the same with uh, with the Da Vinci, so the feeling is that the transition from Da Vinci to Yugo was much easier, at least uh, for me. So if I can add some points uh, to uh, the very nice talk of uh, Bernardo, or let's put it as questions. So number one, we know that uh, the independent arms of the Versus, they weigh about 50 kilograms, which makes that the footprint in the OR is much less than the, the, the Hugo, where they weigh about 250 kilograms. You know to have stability of the instruments inside the body, you need weight counterweight. That's also why the Da Vinci system weighs about like, one ton. And and uh, the uh, the metro. So is this a disadvantage to you, Bernardo, to have uh, these arms uh, that weigh only fifty kilograms, or see you that as an advantage or something to think about in the future? Because fifty kilograms is not too much. So I can presume that there are there is some traveling of the instruments. Second question: We have two different systems in our hospital, which makes that the logistics are quite significant because you need uh, uh, two sets of uh, of uh, spare instruments uh, all the equipment the laparoscopes uh, for the different systems available in your OR uh, so logistically you need a lot of more space you have even more you have now three different systems how do you you solve that problem so on the first topic i think that uh, uh, the weight is a pros and cons uh, particularly the weight of the Da Vinci system, as an example, is a matter of stability on one side, but on the other side, some ORs cannot get the system inside because of the weight. We have an example, we have four ORs, four, I would say, a floor uh, in the two facilities, but one of those could not get the Da Vinci, could get the other two. So from a logistic point of view, is an advantage. From the stability of the surgical procedure, of course, a disadvantage, I think, because you feel, uh, at least uh, on my, my feeling is that uh, you, you had the feeling of a different uh, uh, stability with, uh, with the Hugo Ross uh, uh, compared to the verses in favor of Hugo Ross, as an example. Uh, regarding the storage, of course, this is a big issue. And uh, you need to have a very motivated nurses and uh, a lot of space to store all the material. Uh, you know that uh, sometimes you need to change the scissors on the Hugo Ross uh, every 45 minutes. So it means that you need a lot of storage, particularly for that. I forgot to say another thing that I think is the same uh, perception that you could have. The Hugo Ross scissors are very sharp and this is a very good feeling. There is a new, new different change with the systems. Indeed, uh, um, I, I have another question for Prof Gallagher. And uh, since, uh, as you show in your presentation, uh, you work with different disciplines uh, and we are all uh, urologists, uh, we know that uh, the urologists used to use the robot the most, uh, but nowadays uh, other disciplines uh, uh, overcame uh, and now are using the robot even more than us. Uh, in terms of training, uh, do you think uh, uh, where are we as uh, in the urological field? Uh, the other disciplines are doing uh, better than us. Uh, there is something that we should learn from them. No, I think urology is way ahead of everybody else. And I think that's to do with the structured training program that Alex and Iris developed, you know, more than 10 years ago. The, the other disciplines are looking at this and they're learning lessons from it. And I think they're going to catch up pretty quickly. But I mean, again, we're back to basics. Uh, I mean, if you don't have the metrics to train, uh, the training is inefficient and ineffective. You also need the metrics for the, the benchmarks, and that's really going to be the issue. I mean, we've been developing the metrics across disciplines at RC, you know, for the last few years. Uh, the development of the metrics is slow, and uh, but it, it absolutely needs to be done. The first time you do it, it's, it's faster the next time. So I think urology is still way ahead, but uh, I expect that to change over the next few years. Marco, we also have here a, a Q&A question from Davan Dawan. 
that can be addressed by uh, by Professor uh, Motri and Professor Hoko, and uh, also especially if, by Professor Gallagher. So Daban is asking if, uh, so he, he apparently he only has done uh, open search until now, and he's asking if he has uh, any disadvantage compared to someone who has a laparoscopic or robotic background when he, when he wants to adopt uh, robotic surgery. So how do we transition open surgery surgeons to, to the robotic platforms? Is this possible? What is your perspective? Uh, if I may start, uh, Bernardo, uh, yes. I think we are running out of time, so we'll have to do quickly, I presume. Um, so um, uh, so I think this is an important question. So um, I have now 20 years of experience in, uh, in proctoring people all over uh, the world, basically. And my assumption has been, but Bernardo, correct me if you don't agree, that to train a good open surgeon to robotic surgery is probably easier than a high volume laparoscopic surgeon to retrain them to use the robot. Rob I always say that robotic surgery is laparoscopy, but with a special device, which allows us to overcome the problem of the counterintuitive movements. Well, very experienced lap surgeons, they have like a twist in their brain. They are, they are just used to do everything the opposite way. And uh, while for an open surgery, robotic surgery feels like working with a microscope and uh, it's probably easier to learn, basically. And I will even say more uh, that uh, probably for lap surgeons, uh, the Medtronic robot could be, but we, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, could be easier uh, in their transition than and to have the Da Vinci system where you have all the arms coming from one side. That's my humble opinion. Bernardo, what do you think? Well, I think that it is impossible to add something on a matter of training after you, considering the experience that comes from you that first trained myself 20 years ago. After, I would say, all the experience that uh, Orsi <laughs> that is the leading center for training in the world. So the only thing that I can add is, uh, according to the, my minimal experience on the three platforms, is uh, and the, the the graph that I showed that it seems that uh, people that has a robotic experience has an easier transition to the other systems. That is absolutely uh, the same thing that Alex said. Thanks. Yeah, the, the twist in the brain that Alex is talking about is the fulcrum effect of laparoscopy. And laparoscopic surgeons do automate to it. It's a bit like learning to ride a bicycle and, you know, you're turning the handles one way to go the opposite way. And I, I think it probably is going to be easier to train open surgeons to do robotics because that the fulcrum effect doesn't exist anymore. But uh, I think the question is going to have to be answered quantitatively. And I think it's probably going to be related to the, the aptitude, the technical aptitude of the surgeon. But it's, it's, it's something that really needs to be addressed empirically, which shouldn't be that difficult to do. Yes, probably right. Also, the absence of the articulation and the end of this of yes. the instrument. That's yeah. something that yeah. the laparoscopist. Yeah, not I mean, my, my observation is watching laparoscopic surgeons in the skills lab. <laughs> it's almost like they've forgotten that they actually have a wrist at the end of the instrument. They, they're using them, uh, the robotic instruments like laparoscopic instruments. Yeah. And our tasks are devised or developed to help them overcome that, to force them to use the wrists. Regarding the topic of laparoscopy, very quick, I have a question for Prof. Rocco. You know that uh, the, the versus CMR um, uh, firstly meant, and I think they still want to uh, have their robot also in a hybrid situation between laparoscopy and robotics. So for laparoscopic uh, surgeons, we want to do some phases of the procedure with the la pure laparoscopy and then uh, use uh, some uh, instruments robotically. Uh, my understanding is that you are using it and you use it uh, fully as a robotic system. Do you believe that's uh, a, a better um, aim, let's say, purpose for the robot or they, it's better to be used uh, in this hybrid, uh, hybrid way? Thank you. Very good question. I am not a laparoscop, uh, laparoscopy surgeon. I moved directly from open to robotics. I think I have done 10 laparoscopy in my life. And uh, so uh, my aim is not to use um, a system with a hybrid laparoscopic approach, but I know that some uh, colleagues, general surgeons do it. Personally, 
I think that in 2023, we are in the robotic era. So I think that this kind of hybrid procedures are something that uh, will not uh, run the game uh, very much in the future. So I will stay on the way of robotics. Uh, that makes more sense, in my opinion. Thanks, I agree with you. Uh, Rui, I don't know if you have any other questions. I think uh, we are running out of time. You're uh, muted, Rui. I don't have any other questions. Okay, uh, so uh, I think also in the Q&A uh, tools here, there is no question. So yeah. I would like uh, to thank uh, all the moderators, uh, um, all the speakers uh, for their, for sharing their experience. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed personally uh, the webinar a lot and I'm sure uh, all the attendees do, did as well. And also, I would like to thank uh, Intuitive uh, for uh, supporting this webinar with uh, an educational grant. And uh, last but not least, to thank uh, uh, Rui as co moderator. Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.